In part B of this problem, we need to graph the three stationary states. So let's start off with xi0. So in the example in the book, we've proven that xi0 is equal to this expression over here. So you have all these constants multiplied by this negative e term over here. So these are just constants, and this term over here is essentially e to the power of negative some constant times x squared. So these symbols here, they're all constants. So what is this graph going to look like? So first of all, notice that this graph is always going to be above the x-axis. This is always positive. So if you substitute numbers from negative infinity to infinity, you'll see that this is always positive. And then as you, see, you can see, if x tends to infinity, this expression will tend to 0. If you have e to the power of negative infinity, it will tend to 0. And then the same goes for negative infinity, because this is a square, uh, square so it just becomes positive infinity again. So as it tends towards the left-hand side, it will also tend towards 0. So it's, uh, essentially, your graph will look something like this. So this, you have this x-axis as the asymptote, and then on both sides of the x-axis, if you tend towards negative infinity, and then if you tend towards positive infinity, it will always tend closer and closer towards the x-axis. So this is what xi0 will look like. Now for the second, second stationary state, uh, second graph, the first stationary state, uh, there is actually an example in the book where Griffiths finds the finds the uh, expression for the first stationary state, and then I'm not going to prove it here. You just apply the ladder operator to the to xi0 to obtain this expression, but then he finds that the uh, xi1 is equal to this expression here. So what is this graph going to look like? So what I'd like uh, what I like to do when I think about these problems is that first of all uh, we can isolate these constants here first. So this is not going to change the shape of the graph much. So here we have this x over here multiplied by this e to the power of negative kx squared. So I like to think about the graph like this. So originally there is just an x. So if you have a graph that is just an x, it looks something like this. But then we introduce some change to it. We introduce this e to the power of negative kx squared function to it. So essentially we are adding this term over to this graph over here. So as you can imagine, uh, near the near the origin, uh, not much not much is going to change to this graph because near the origin, when x is equal to zero, this term here is going to be equal to one. And then if you move slightly away from 0, say if you're at a small number like 0 0.1, then this number is still very close to 1. So if you multiply 1 to the function x, then you don't really change the function that much. But as you go on, as x gets bigger and bigger, as you tend toward infinity, this term here starts becoming significant. And then as you can see from the last, uh, from this last part over here, as you tend toward negative infinity and positive infinity, uh, this is this uh, this function over here. This e to the power of negative kx squared is going to tend towards zero. So near the origin, this e term here is not going to uh, cause much change to our function over here. So you can guess that the graph will look something like this. So near the near the origin, it's still going to look approximately like a straight line. But then as x ten, uh, gets bigger and bigger, as it tends towards positive infinity and negative infinity, this term over here is, starting, is going to start uh, becoming significant. It's going to get smaller and smaller. As you can see, it tends towards zero. So uh, the net effect of, of the graph is that it's going to push the original x function over here towards zero. So without this term, it's just going to stretch all the way to infinity. But now that you've added this term, now you're pushing it down because this term starts to dominate. And then the same goes for the other side. So eventually it will start veering downwards and then tend closer and closer towards zero. So this is what this what the first stationary state would approximately look like. And so we can apply the same reasoning to the second stationary state. So in the last video, we proved that xi2 is equal to this expression over here. And then we use the same reasoning as we did for the first stationary state. So for the first stationary state, we consider this x function, and then we applied this uh, e function over here. So in this case, this time we have a quadratic function. So once again, we have all these constants, which we can sort of ignore. 
and then we have this quadratic component, and then we have this e term that's going to push this function closer and closer towards zero as you tend toward positive and negative infinity. So without this function, if we just focus on this quadratic function, this is going to look something like this, right? So this is just a quadratic uh, function with an intercept at negative one. So we, we apply the same reasoning as we did before. So near the origin, this function here is approximately equal to one, so it's not gonna change this, the shape of this function much. So if you're near the origin, you can pretty much guess the graph is gonna look approximately like your parabola. But as you tend towards infinity, as x gets larger and larger, it's gonna push this graph down towards zero. So this term is going to start to dominate. And so in the end, you get something like this. So this is the graph for the second stationary state. And as you can see, we applied pretty much the same reasoning as we did for this case over here. So this is how you graph the three stationary states.